So it is a treasure, a treasure that this community has built. This is the Art Cityscape Podcast. Hi everyone, this is the fifth episode of the Art Cityscape. I'm excited for what we have lined up for you today. First, we'll have an interview with the Springville Museum of Art director, Dr. Rita Wright. Following that, I'll dive into some of my favorite Art City history. And finally, we'll end with an Art City update. Here's the interview with Rita. Okay, I'm here with Dr. Rita Wright, who is the director of the Springville Museum of Art. And Rita, I don't call you doctor enough. I feel like that's... That's just fine. Okay. (laughs) So Rita, what led you to become the director of the Springville Museum of Art? I think, first of all, it was a love of the Springville Museum of Art. I had visited here on different in different capacities as an educator, as a colleague with the director. And uh, I just absolutely loved the look and feel of it, Springville, and that it dealt with Utah artists. I wanted to ask about Springville specifically, what you love about this town. You are not from here but you work here and you get to see the residents at the museum and the artists. And what do you love about Springville? We've been discussing that a lot in different meetings. What's iconic Springville? It feels like a little idyllic Hamlet kind of over the years. And I did actually, my great, great grandfather was one of the earliest founders of Springville. My grandfather was born here. I knew that I had visited great aunts. But it was always like, I'm going to this little out of the way place, but it has lots of trees, beautiful scenery. That's great. And I I want to mostly talk about the museum, but I want to say, Rita, that um, I've known you since I've worked here. We've been at meetings together and I've noticed that you're not just interested in the museum. It seems like whatever meeting we're at, you're taking notes and asking questions, whether it's about our power system or water tanks or whatever. And I wanted to ask why you do that and how it's helped you. Wow, it's it's been like an MBA, believe me, for a museum <laughs> director. But I'm not only a museum director, the way that Springville City is structured, I'm a city director, which means I do have accountabilities to city administration, to the mayor and the city council. And I figure the opportunities I have sitting in council meetings, work study meetings, listening to what Public Works is doing. When is the Museum Street going to be closed? When are we going to have uh, visitors coming to City Council to express their views, which we use a lot in our visitor studies? I just think they're fascinating to learn about the ways that the city, um, city directors, city employees collaborate, and that what we do at the museum impacts what happens buildings and grounds people, public works. And I I love sitting in there because it has been such an education, not only on civics and government, but on the way that communities collaborate and come together. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I think that's great. And I think it's easy for us to feel like I belong to this department and we all do vastly different things, but I think it works better when we're all Team Springville and working together. Yeah. And it's fun because I get to go back to my staff and say, you can't believe it, but we spent three hours talking about Highline Ditch. Does anybody <laughs> even know what that is? And so it's, uh, I hope that it becomes infectious for my staff as well, that this place we call Springville, they really are an important part of, but they also have an opportunity to get to know it a little more deeply by working here. Great. Let's talk a little bit about the museum. Let's talk a lot about the museum. Why did Springville get an art museum to begin with? Because of kids. And I think that's the greatest legacy we have that in the, well, actually in the late 1800s, there was a movement in Springville, an art movement that wanted young people to know about some of the artists that lived here, wanted uh, many of the artists, not many, but a lot of Utah artists were going to France to study And so the community became aware that uh, several of the artists from Springville had gone to France, John Hafen and Cyrus Dallin. And uh, so the educators in Springville, some of the community leaders, again, very community-minded people in Springville, 
thought that they wanted the children to be exposed not only to pictures they saw in books, but they wanted them to see original art. And so in 1903, two of those artists, John Haven, Cyrus Dallin, decided to donate to the high school kids some original art. Uh, John Haven's Mountain Stream and Cyrus Dallin's sculpture, plaster, uh, that he eventually had cast in bronze of Paul Revere that's actually outside of the Old North Church in Boston. And so they wanted the kids to have these. And from that point on, every year after the 1920s, the students would hold salons where they'd send out a call to all artists across the country at that point to come and show here. It was getting to be very big. The word salon referring to what artists were seeing, the, the salon in Paris, uh, some of the other places in Europe. And they wanted to have that same effect here of artists submitting and being judged or juried and then being able to share those works with the public. So the kids took those acquisitions and the students themselves hung it, worked on getting the jury shows ready. There were actually some pretty prominent American artists now that we saw entering the Salon Rockwell, Kent, Norman Rockwell. Some of those artists, uh, since that time, we are now on our 97th, almost a hundred years. And, uh, We've we've pretty much narrowed the the call to Utah artists or people had who had been affiliated, studied in Utah, and we don't do the national reach because we have so many that are submitting now. Yeah, and if my math's right, there have been a couple of years we haven't had a salon. A few. Yeah, and and it was mostly well, yes, in um, during the depression, and then of course last year. We had such sadness among the community that we weren't having the salon because of COVID that we managed to shift it to the fall, figured out a way last fall to have the spring salon fall edition, and uh, then we're doing the salon right now at the museum. So very brief periods where we didn't have the salon. Huge. Yeah. That has continued this long. I'm so glad you were able to do it in the fall. We went as a family. I was talking to Emily, who works at the museum, and she said that, um, you know, I was I was asking, you know, what has the museum learned during the pandemic? Has it been cool to put new kinds of materials and information out in different channels? And she said, yes, but the museum is really something to go and experience. How tough has it been the last year and a half? I think there are a couple of of sides to that. And yes, the museum, I had to write at one point for another museum, a philosophy of education. And it started with a museum as a place of experience. So obviously that firsthand experience was going to be different. But we also found that people came to the museum for solace, for a place where they could feel safe and Pretty much it's in line with what the dedicatory prayer of the museum said when uh, David O. McKay, who was an LDS church leader, but also an educator, referred to the museum as a sanctuary of beauty and a temple of contemplation, meaning a place where people could get centered, feel that spiritual sense. And I had a number of people come to me during the pandemic and say, we, we haven't been going to church. We haven't been having the kids go to school, but we can come here, walk through safely, quietly, and feel that meditative, contemplative mood that, that we've longed for. Yeah. And now, am I correct? You're back to regular hours and capacity. Except Wednesday nights, we've, we found that eight o'clock was a good time to end. And so that for staff and for, you know, different reasons. But yeah, we are pretty much back to full schedule. We are seeing the events calendars with weddings, family celebrations, reunions, filling back up, which is exciting for us because, as you indicated at the beginning, it is a place of experience, of memory, of imagination. And those are things that you just can't capture looking at something that's uh, two-dimensional or that's on a, a video Zoom screen. Okay, Rita, we talked a little bit about... Um how it is that we got a museum and what's going on at the museum. A question I want to ask, and I imagine this is something that 
you justify have to justify a lot is why does Springville still have an art museum? Not a lot of cities do, and certainly not a lot of small cities like us. Why is it still such an important asset to the community? Well, it's interesting because our current mayor uh, remembers as a kid writing what they called an art theme. And all of the students in English classes had to write an art theme, which built this idea in the community that art was important. It was for everybody. It was worth talking about in a school level and with the community. And also when you've got the, the moniker of being the art city, kind of think, is that just because we have a museum, is it the attitudes about art that are cultivated in the children, in the community? And it is, it's challenging. There are a lot of smaller art galleries, little museums that have not had the community support this has. If you were try to try to start an art museum today, any place probably, at least in Utah or in any smaller community around the country, it would not happen. People would not be able to get that kind of support going, maybe for a big arts complex or something. So the fact that this community has been brought up on the art museum, um, many of the community members have come to the art museum with families over the years, then bring their own children. And I think that's what instills it in the hearts and minds of the community. It's expensive, no doubt. And we have responsibilities to come up with quite a bit of our budget through donations, people that are invested in seeing us share art. Uh, even the state of Utah helps us with money to do the art classes for students out in the schools. So it becomes a real collaborative effort to maintain a building. Our building was built in 1937 with money that came um, through the Works Progress Administration, which was a post-depression period of getting people back to work. And so our building is getting very old and it's hard to keep up. And our facilities and grounds people are always trying to help figure us figure out ways to keep it working. That's where we talk about the collaboration we talked about earlier. It's great for me to be able to have time to sit down with facilities, talk to them, to be able to talk to the electricians who have been working on this building for years and then go, oh, you don't want to do that line there because I've been upstairs in the rafters and I know where it goes. So those kinds of long-term collaborations by city employees, community members, I think have instilled it in the hearts and minds of the community. And uh, we just keep hoping that more and more residents come and take advantage of the kind of feeling that happens when you share the hands of artists and their creativity. Yeah. And I, you know, I always think about how cities make lives, people's lives better. Right. And I think what a, an enriching opportunity that we have here. And it's not just the museum. We have a great rec center, a great library. But I feel like with all of these things, families here can just have such a well-rounded experience and, and really have their lives enriched by the amenities that we have. Yeah, and it's really rare. And uh, where I raised my kids in Salt Lake has a little art project area in their civic building. And their part-time director, who only is in there a couple of hours a week, has said numerous times, how, how does this go and how does a city like Springville support this? And it's years and years the last two mayors have commented about their experiences as children. They've donated. They've supported. So it is a pretty much a treasure, a treasure that this community has built. Yeah. I want to ask, so the Spring Salon, you mentioned that earlier, the 97th Salon we're in the middle yeah. of right now. And there are other great exhibitions on display. I know one that's new is Utah Women Making History. It's a collection of educational illustrations by Brooke Smart. Is there anything coming in the near future that you can talk about? Um, anything for patrons to be excited about? Sure. Um, our most well-attended show is always the quilt show. And that's coming up next following the Spring Salon. That's one of those that is a real Utah icon. But I've had friends from out of state who bring their quilt groups to Utah just to see our quilt show. Uh, we will have in the fall, which I have really felt um, deeply about, is the spiritual and religious show. 
Uh, I think as we've seen people expanding their understandings of different spiritual traditions and belief systems, we try to address that. And so it's becoming a much broader audience that, that share those traditions and the artists are doing some really amazing things in the fall. And then next spring, we're going to have some real fun surprises that will come out and uh, we will reveal that as we can. Well, great. We're really excited about that. And thanks so much, Rita, for your time today and for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Jack. About nine months ago, I started a weekly series of social media posts called Art City History. Through that, I've shared both well-known Springville history and also things that time has largely forgotten. I've scoured books, journals, newspapers, and photos to find information. I've learned a lot that I haven't posted yet, and despite a hiatus from Art City History, I look forward to restarting that effort soon. Of all the things I've discovered and shared, there's one story I can't get out of my head. Art City has produced prolific creators throughout its history. The biggest names are Cyrus Dallin and John Hafen, who were world-renowned artists and helped start the Springville Museum of Art. Then there's George Edward, or G.E. Anderson, whose turn-of-the-century photographs hold historical value for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the state of Utah, and the entirety of the Western United States. As impressive as those three were, the figure who most stands out to me was a young woman who was hired on as G.E. Anderson's apprentice at his Springville studio in 1892. Elfie Huntington faced substantial trials as a child. At age four, she contracted scarlet fever and permanently lost her hearing. A couple years later, her mother passed away and her father placed her in the care of her grandmother. Elfie was just a teen when her grandmother died, and she moved in with her aunt and uncle. They encouraged her artistic passion and helped her master lip reading. She attended public school rather than a school for the deaf. She became well educated. At G.E. Anderson's studio, Huntington became a well-liked and reliable assistant. She learned to retouch negatives and hand color photographs. She quickly graduated to darkroom duties and camera operation. She managed the studio when Anderson was traveling. To Anderson's devastation, she announced in 1903 with fellow apprentice Joseph Bagley that the two were leaving to start their own studio. The Huntington and Bagley studio advertised, We go anywhere, anytime, to photograph anything. And so they did with Elfie driving her motorcycle and Joseph riding along as they took tens of thousands of photos, mostly portraits, throughout the state. Carrie Stevens-Jones tells the story that Huntington was at the wheel one day and hit a bump in the road. Because she couldn't hear, it wasn't until she had returned to Springville that she realized Joseph Bagley had fallen off the back of the motorcycle somewhere along the road. G.E. Anderson was more renowned for his talent, but Elfie Huntington ran the better photography business. She and Bagley managed a successful studio for more than 30 years. They wed in 1936, and Bagley died of a heart attack the same year. Huntington closed the studio a few years later and lived to the age of 80. Her work, especially her personal photography, is described as honest, innocent, and frequently humorous. Her subjects are often in costume or with animals. Huntington is buried in the Springville Historic Cemetery, in a grave as obscure as her story. Brigham Young University's Harold B. Lee Library owns the Huntington Bagley Collection, which contains more than 2,000 photographs and can be accessed online for free. Okay, for our Art City update, the first thing that we want to acknowledge and remind you about is with the current drought, just make sure that you are applying smart practices to your property, um, doing things like avoiding watering the lawn between the hours of 10 a.m. and 6 p.m., uh, making sure that your sprinklers are working properly, raising the height of your mower a little bit to leave your grass a little bit longer. We think we're going to be okay here in Springville in terms of having enough water. With this, we'll also remind you that we have tiered water rates here in Springville, which means 
the more you use, the higher you're paying per gallon used. So a good way to save money on your utility bill is to conserve water. Our second item is related to the drought, and that's that we have firework season coming up with a couple of holidays. We have a map online that shows areas where fireworks are prohibited and where they're permitted. In general, they're prohibited near the wilderness interface on the east side of town and most of the west side of town. If you're not sure, please check out our website, springville.org. And then in the permitted areas, fireworks can only be discharged from two days prior to and one day after July 4th and July 24th. And we want to say as well, coming from our fire department and the city, that it's very dry and it's very hot, and in general we discourage the use of fireworks this year. Okay, the next item is that the farmer's market is returning. July 5th will be the first one, so coming up just this next week, this next Monday evening. They'll be in Monday evenings for several months, running from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. here at the Civic Center. We have a lot of awesome vendors coming this year. Also on Mondays, the Recreation Department is hosting Movies in the Park, a fun free series of movies this summer to come and watch with your family at Spring Acres Arts Park on Monday evenings around dusk, usually around 9 p.m. here in the summer. On July 5th, there won't be a movie due to the 4th of July holiday. July 12th, we will return with The Sandlot, and July 19th, Raya and the Last Dragon. Finally, the last note is that election season is coming up. And here in Springville, we'll have three seats open for the city council and also the position of mayor. And the important deadline on that is August 10th through August 17th is the declaration of candidacy filing periods. So if you're thinking about running for city council or for mayor, the time period to do that is August 10th through the 17th. We'll get more information about that. And this year we're doing ranked choice voting. Okay, that's it for the podcast. We just want to give a huge thanks to Rita Wright at the museum. What a wonderful interview with her. Great things are happening over there. As always, I'm thankful for your input and your questions, the things that you want us to talk about on the podcast. We're always happy to receive those. You can reach out to our social media pages. You can also send an email to podcast at springville.org. We'd love to talk about what you want to talk about. That'll wrap up this episode of the Art Cityscape. I'm Jack Urquhart. Until next time, have a great week.